My name is Patsy Hicks, and I'm Director of Education here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to what will be a fascinating conversation, I am sure. And in order to make sure we don't miss any part of it, I'm going to ask you to take a minute and turn off all electronic devices, um, but especially your cell phones. Although it's always interesting, sometimes the rings actually somehow magically connect to what's being said. <laughs> but we won't go for that right now. We're extremely fortunate to have a real parallel story this afternoon in that today we've invited two artists, one visual, one literary, to share this stage and ask them to further share with us their reflections on a watery world. Samir Pandya is the author of the short story collection, The Blind Writer, long listed for the 2016 Penn Open Book Award. His forthcoming novel, isn't that a grand thing to be able to say? <laughs> His forthcoming novel, Members Only, will be out in 2020 from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He teaches creative writing and literature in the Department of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara and has been instrumental in shaping our writing in the galleries program being piloted this year. Tony De Los Reyes has won recognition both as an exceptional teacher at the Windward School in Los Angeles who truly transforms his students' lives and has them doing projects on freeway overpasses and other interesting non-traditional places, and as an artist of international status. His work, based on Herman Melville's classic novel of the sea, was featured in a show at this museum in 2010, curated by the gifted Julie Joyce, who is in our audience today, and entitled Chasing Moby Dick. One of the paintings from that show, now in our collection, is currently on view in the galleries upstairs. Inspired by the site-specific installation by Los Angeles-based artist April Street, the Mariner's Grand Staircase, which you probably noticed as you walked in, currently installed in the museum's park lobby, the conversation today explores the symbolic potential and inspirational capacity of the sea. As Herman Melville wrote, why did some hold the sea holy? Why, like Narcissus, do we see ourselves in rivers and oceans? Why, with its associations of unpredictability, infinity, the beginnings of life, turbulent passions, unfettered freedom, purification, solitude, and rebellion, does water seduce us, console us, and alarm us? Here to pursue some of those perhaps unanswerable questions are Tony De Los Reyes and Samir Pandya. Does this work? Does that work? It works. Hello. Does that work? Uh, um, so, uh, I think Tony and I are just going to try to <laughs> talk through the flashing lights as I uh, So a couple of things. So I thought what we would try to do today is um, talk about the April Street of, uh, exhibition that is out in the hallway right now. But you know, Patsy has given us a much more, uh, I think, watery mandate in uh, giving our reflections on water <laughs> writ large. And so uh, I thought what we would do is we would start by talking about a little bit of um, what we have outside. And then, uh, then we'll slowly transition back to um, kind of our thoughts, uh, Tony talking about uh, works of art that he is a fan of. And I'm going to talk about some different poems and uh, excerpts from novels that uh, that work particularly well for what we are doing here. So Tony, you want to start us off? We're, we're, we're going to go all over the place. We will touch all the seven seas. There will, will be no, no watery depth we will not touch. Um, so, but I think it's interesting. We're, we, we've been talking back and forth about how to grasp this unfathomable subject. And um, it, it just goes on and on forever. And I think we're very uh, fortunate to have this 
this piece start uh, of talking about, I was able to interview April. How many of you have seen the piece? Uh, um, it's it, great. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting piece. It's, it's somewhat challenging because it doesn't give you a clear idea. And I think that was part of April's uh, uh, attitude, was that when you're dealing with the sea, there is no direct line. There is no direct, there is no specific compass heading. The sea itself sort of guides, uh, has its own agenda. And so, um, just I'll tell, for those of you who haven't seen it, I'll give you a, a brief idea of what it is. It's an installation based on the Grand Staircase, which is a really tricky place to, to do an installation. It's a very odd space, and April and I talked about it. She said, we, we sort of agreed it's kind of a haunted space. Because when you, when you go look at it, both staircases seem to go to nowhere. Yeah. It's like, you know, most Grand's cases, you can you get a sense of where you're headed to, but in this case, you're confronted with a large wall and then these just these two direct uh, opposite offshoots. And so she decided to use that um, to illustrate a story she'd come across, which is this couple, a married couple, who had uh, uh, made a record journey from New York to San Francisco in 1851, 89 days in a clipper ship called a Flying Cloud. And the, the, uh, this is in 1851, so the feat of that was, was challenging enough. The idea that it was a married couple, which is very unusual, right, on, on, on these types of uh, voyages, um, allowed her to sort of look through the story into the, the permutations of what the relationship of the couple might be like, what the superstructure of the, of the ship might be like, what the ocean is like, and so she all these different types of materials and surfaces uh, some figurative, um, but all very fictitious. So you hear, have this story which is, which is very much based on a real event, but at the same time, it had, it has, the, the installation has no historical purpose. And I think that's something she was very interested in, in doing. She also wanted to have a lot of fun with it. So, so some of you may have heard uh, uh, audio in the piece. It's actually a little hard to hear. Um, and I think that was intentional. But what you hear is a conversation between the husband and the wife as they move throughout their lives and look back on this, this magical journey that they had in 1851. But it also is a reminisce about, about the relationship as a whole and the meaning of life. And there's, there's sort of this idea that as we move up the stairs, we transcend the earthly plane, terrestrial plane, or the watery world, and we move on to our private memories and moments of being uh, that all of us have internally that we can't fully share with even our, our, our greatest loved ones. So I think um, <laughs> that's the place to start, right? So this is ocean voyage, and sure that it's about this, this, this amazing uh, historic event, but at the same time, it's really about people. And it's about how we approach the ocean uh, in terms of memory, in terms of hope, in terms of dread and fear. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, this is your piece that is upstairs a little bit, that, that, that the piece that's upstairs. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the connection between where this piece came from and, and April Street at the same time. Um, so. Uh, uh, as Patsy said, I, I had a show here in, in 2010 about Moby Dick, and this is a painting that's currently up. And um, this is the flag of 1851, and it's kind of funny that April's uh, piece is based about a journey that happened in 1851, but the flag of 1851 was when Moby Dick was written by Herman Melville. <coughs> and it has, it has fewer stars than, than of course, we're, what we're used to. But it was also the time in which the United States uh, made it from coast to coast, where Manifest Destiny Destiny had really finally hit. And um, what lies at the end of the great westward expansion is just this other expansion of water. And in particular, the Pacific, which is the largest body of water on Earth. And so I decided to use this, these dual images of, of national identity. And I think the uncertainty of America with the uncertainty of, of how we uh, see the ocean. It's not, always, it's not always beautiful. It's inky and black and disturbing and of course my body of work in 20, between 20, 2006 and 2010 were based on sort of the, the issues we were doing with the, the war in Iraq and the idea of a kind of Ahab and Moby Dickness to to the uh, the war there. Can I ask very, I mean this is 
it, um, how might this look different in 2018? Wow. Actually, I think it, ma it makes more sense to me now. Um, I've always thought of America as being a both thrilling and horrific place, a place of amazing dreams and also a place of very unsettling histories. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, we're living in that, that moment right now. And, and uh, we're kind of, you know, everyone talks about the black and whiteness of politics right now. So I think this painting makes even more sense. <laughs> There's no color. There's, we're just all too, so divided, and, and it's just a matter of, of darks and lights. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, when Tony and I kind of sat down to figure out how to do this, right, and we came up with this idea of birth, death, and rebirth, which seems a ridiculous way to think about all of this. And we went back and forth with these images, and we went back and forth with these quotes, and we were trying to kind of place them that here for the first 10 minutes we'll talk about birth, and then we'll talk about death, and then on a hopeful note we'll talk about rebirth, and then we can all go have uh, wine. And, um, and I think that what we found was, as we were looking at these images, as we were looking at these pieces, is that making those distinctions were incredibly hard to do. Right, that in a sense, that for all the pieces where I was convinced that here is my great birth poem, it was in fact a terrific death poem. Right, and so part of what we realized is how much these images are, how much these ideas are moving in and out of all of these pieces that we're working on. But the second thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about was that there's a way in which when we talk about the ocean, when we talk about water, we talk about it in the language of natural space, right? Which is that uh, we are kind of, we have to save the oceans. The kind of the language of environmentalism in a certain way is kind of what nature was and what nature has become, right? And I think that part of what we wanted to do was to speak slightly differently about it in terms of the ways in which specific kinds of cultural specificities imbue the way in which we talk about the water, right? Meaning that does kind of one group of folks talk about and think about waterness in different kinds of ways, right? And as kind of we were trying to work through this, I was trying to figure out um, what my earliest memory of water was, right? As a kind of just an idea of when it is that this happens, right? So I, I when as I was prepping for this, I, I texted my sister, and this is not meant to be serious. I said. Do you remember how old I was when I nearly drowned, right? Because when I was two and a half years old, we were at a lake. At this point, we lived in India, in Ahmedabad. There was a lake outside, and um, uh, I had, and she says, she wrote back, the two texts that she wrote back, she said, 2.5, and she says, I stood there helpless, right? Which is, clearly, she has issues about that moment as much as I do. And um, it, it's an interesting moment, right, which is that it, it is, I was kind of falling in, and my uncle, who was my eldest, who was my father's eldest brother, who turned out to be a complete near do well in the family, was of course turned out to be my favorite uncle, right? Because clearly I have this clear association of his kind of arm pulling me up. And as I was thinking about this kind of early moment, I was kind of struck with, and this will be the last bit of family story, but I was struck with these stories about my grandmother, right? And so my grandmother, who's my father's mother, was a, um, was a deeply kind of religious woman, right? And she had profound issues with dirt, meaning about purity, pollution, who she could touch, right? So when we were children, when she would feed us, the idea was that the plate, the, the spoon that she would use could never hit the plate, right? So she'd always feed, you know, kind of drop the food from up on high. Uh, if, you know, she went outside, the immediate thing she would do was she would come home and take a bath, right? Now, this is all kind of wound up in really profoundly troublesome, problematic ideas of Brahmanism and kind of everything that goes with that, right? Which is, there is a significant amount of issues that go with it, right? And so all of these ideas were in my mind, and when I arrived at graduate school, I found this terrific, I was assigned this terrific book by Mary Douglas, who's a, a social anthropologist who's now dead 40 years. But there's something about, and I kind of picked up purity and danger again, kind of in thinking about this gathering today, and there's something about when I read that book, 
it completely opened up, in some ways, these rituals around purity of water and the dirtiness of dirt that I had kind of grown up with culturally, but I had no way of analytically understanding. Right? And I, I want to leave this text up here for a second is because Mary Douglas is not the most clear kind of, uh, her language is not as clear as you'd want it to be. But she says, as we know it, dirt is essentially disorder. There is no such thing as absolute dirt. It exists in the eye of the beholder. If we shun it, it is not because of craven fear, still less dread or holy terror, nor do our ideas about disease account for the range of our behavior in cleaning or avoiding dirt. Dirt offends against order. Eliminating it is not a negative movement, but a positive effort to organize the environment. Now, that is a lot of words in one paragraph, but part of, I think, what I took away from Douglas then and what I take away from Douglas now is that there is this profound kind of social capital that dirt has, right? That, you know, a certain someone who has a large Twitter following, um, you know, is constantly talking about groups of people that are dirty and groups of people that are not, right? And I think that that is this kind of Douglas type language that is being used uh, when we talk about it. And it, that, that connection there I found really quite um, useful, right? In terms of kind of why, in some ways, the, the, the presence of cleanliness was about, not about actually cleanliness, but about the disorder that comes from dirt. Yeah. Um, do you have an early water memory? I do. Uh, um, I was just curious, how many of you uh, grew up on the west coast near the ocean? Because I think your consciousness about the ocean is very different. Was, yeah. So I grew up in Los Angeles, and, and um, even though I lived early years in the valley, um, we moved to Redondo Beach. Uh, when I was very young. And so my first images of, of, the, of the ocean are not visual, they're actually uh, oral. They're just the sound of the ocean. We, apparently, we, maybe we're a couple blocks from the beach, so we get very, very, very quiet at night, and you could actually hear the pulsi pulsing waves breaking on the beach, and that absolutely gorgeous rhythmic pattern. And um, that combined with the mist and the spray, and that, that feeling of cleanliness, oddly enough, that, that fog can have for me, um, that, those are the memories I have. That, and as you're saying fear, my mom uh, was uh, paranoid that we, that we were in the path of a tsunami because we were living down a beach. And I remember her being afraid of the ocean. And so I think, yeah, from the very early on, I was, I was captivated by this sort of uh, uh, desirability of being close to it and hearing it and, and of course being in it, but also uh, my parents being, at least my mother being afraid of it. So um, I'm going to talk about two pieces uh, very quickly. Um, uh, Via Selmans, which as some of you may know, uh, really one an amazing artist, um, has a ter terrific show at the SF MoMA right now, and then Mark Rothko. Um, and both of these pieces, uh, the Untitled Ocean is a drawing on the left and the Mark Rothko is a painting on the right. And uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, are, are you familiar with Via Selman's work? If, please go to San Francisco and see the show. It, it, it's, it's, it's a career survey. She's brilliant. One of the things that she's, she does is she she, she her self-proclaimed uh, statement is that she transfers one surface to another. So even though she uses a, uses a lot of found images to make these drawings and paintings and prints, these are photographs that she actually took on the edge of the Venice Pier in Los Angeles, a pier that, that we go a lot with, uh, with, with the kids and the family. And as most of you know, you, we, we definitely look out when we look at the ocean, but um, we're very captivated by looking down and not seeing the horizon line. And I think that's really important too when I think about Monet and his garden. Uh, most of his paintings take place below the horizon line. And so this is the idea of water as something, kind of like my memory, of something that's, that's hypnotic and uh, just sort of dances in this really slow, slow and beautiful way. So the idea of her taking this and committing 
the hours and hours and hours it takes to take a pencil and transfer the photo, the, first of all, looking at that image in the ocean, taking a photograph of it, taking it back to the studio and then drawing it meticulously. She's not just translating a surface to a surface to a surface, she's also creating a fixed memory. She's creating a place in time on the paper that can't be captured either in a photograph or in um, the ocean itself because those things are, are, are much more, um, I don't know, they're much more ephemeral. There's something oddly fixed about a drawing. Right? We draw because we want to take a stand, we want to draw, we draw the line literally and, and, and here she's using all this time and energy with a pencil, so the, one of the most elemental things you can possibly do to make one of the most complex images anyone could possibly make. And I think, I think the rhetoric of that endeavor is, is astounding and is evidence of how powerful the ocean is as a, uh, a catalyst to, for artists to make work about the ocean. And then, you know, everyone knows Mark Rothko, the, like, the, the most famous uh, bleeding heart <laughs> in the abstract expressionism. Uh, nobody you know, painted with more uh, tenacity about uh, eros and death. And, um, but this is an odd painting, and most people don't think of it. When they think of Mark Rothko, they think of the multiforms, and they think of the big locks of color and those pulsating hues that just sort of punch out very slowly through the, through the surface. But this is an odd painting, and it's called Slow Swirl by the Edge of the Sea, and it was made in 1944, before he became famous. He made this painting um, surrounded with his, his group of uh, you know, American slash surrealist hooligans and making these fantastic uh, uh, attempts to make an American art form uh, based uh, on the surrealist methods of, of Europe. But what's great about this painting to me is kind of the backstory and that um, it's, it's maybe one of the best figurative paintings that Mark Rothko ever made. Um, he made this painting in 1944 when he was uh, dating and courting his, his second wife, Mel. And uh, we tend to think of Rothko as being the universalist, the transcendentalist. But here, my imagining this couple at the edge of the sea, watching the swirls of the waves and having that sort of swirling faith in each other's love, I think is, is a really beautiful moment to be, uh, for us to think about the... Uh, the personality of an artist who is known for much more uh, grand things. And it's also just a, it's just, a, it's just like a sweet painting. And, and uh, yeah, I thought it was a really good uh, image of how the sea can be a glorious moment uh, as, as well as uh, just something hypnotic. Although there's elements of that in this as well. Yeah. So, you know, when Tony sent me this, um, it somehow kind of this particular piece landed me um, with Derek Walcott, uh, and in some ways, I think this is some the poem that I wanted to talk about the most, right? And um, just a kind of very brief background. So, well, I think Walcott was born in 1932, and V.S. Naipaul. So, Walcott was born in Santa Lucia, and Walcott and Naipaul was born in Trinidad, right? And Trinidad, uh, Naipaul is the one, both of whom, you know, uh, Walcott in the 80s and then Naipaul in the 90s would go on to win. Uh, the Nobel Prize, and I think in some ways Naipaul was out of the gates first, right? And what I mean by that is he was very quick to leave Trinidad. He turned 18 and he got a government scholarship that landed him at Oxford. He was there for four years, and if you see any of the bios that Naipaul has, it always says, you know, uh, after four years at Oxford, he has never held another job, right? So Naipaul produced a significant amount of, his oeuvre is massive, right, of both novels and nonfiction. And the thing about Naipaul was his desire to get out of Trinidad as quickly as he could, right? Because for him, he saw Trinidad as a small, history-less place. And the idea that he would cross the ocean and that he would go make something of himself in London, right? And that became this kind of obsession and so much of kind of what Naipaul wrote about was this, this idea that there is no history, no idea of a sense that people have a sense of their past as a way of understanding their present and future you know, in the Caribbean in the way that it has existed 
in the metropole in England and France and all of these places that he looked to, right? And I think that what Walcott does in some ways as a response to Naipaul, but I think as a response to this kind of larger idea of historylessness is uh, published this poem, I think in the mid 1970s. Uh, where are your monuments, your battles, martyrs? Where is your tribal memory? Sirs, in that gray vault, the sea, the sea has locked them up. The sea is history. And I think that that line, the sea is history, and the way that he capitalizes it is what I find particularly interesting about it, right? Which is that part of the point that Walcott is trying to make is that the middle passage is history, right? That in a way that the Atlantic slave trade is the great historic moment that begins the founding of the new world, right? And so that there is a way in which part of what Walcott is trying to do is say that there is a very kind of different relationship to the way we understand that moment. First, there was the heaving oil, heavy as chaos. Then, like a light at the end of the tunnel, the lantern of a caravel, and that was Genesis. And the kind of hardest lines here, then there were the packed cries, the shit, the moaning, exodus, right? And these kind of, and this is the first two, st three stanzas of the poem. It's a much longer poem. It goes on for two or three pages. And part of what Walcott is trying to do is, in some ways, what I was saying earlier about kind of <coughs> the ways in which these kind of watery spaces are imbued with particular cultural particularities, right? And I think that uh, what Walcott is trying to do is both reclaim that space as a space of history, as a space where very particular lives were lost. And I think at the same time, to talk about the Caribbean, to talk about in his particular case, uh, Santa Lucia, and to say that uh, this kind of this idea, right, which is that kind of the voice that he is uh, ventriloquizing in the beginning, right, the, the colonial voice, which is where are your monuments, your battles, your martyrs, right? Where is the, the markers of the ways in which you can say these are, this is our historic past? And I think that in some ways he darkens that sea significantly, right? That in a way that, you know, when you were talking about the inkiness, and that, that word inkiness, I think, in some ways, will, it'll, it pops up with another quote that I have, comes up often, right? Mm -hmm. Which is how much uh, poets in particular use that as the, the adjective, the metaphor, to talk about the space, right? Which is, so often we think of it as, you know, as this notion of blueness and deep blue sea. And I think usually, uh, whether through fatigue or otherwise, I think that idea doesn't seem to come up very often in, you know, and this is I mean, the perfect example of it, right? The way that this has been done kind of in juxtaposition with what, um, yeah. with what Wolcott is doing. Um, from Wolcott, and I'll be done with poems after this, uh, because poems are hard and they're hard to figure out. But for, for part of the way, this is, you know, TSL, this is, I think, the easiest, most accessible part of the wasteland, right? Which is a really, really, for me, an inaccessible poem. There's, I find that there are these, kind of, when I'm teaching, there are these, you know, books from the Western canon that everyone says that they have read and they understand but so few of us have, right, including myself, right, which is the, you know, Ulysses by Joyce, Wasteland by Eliot, and, you know, Sound of the Fury by Faulkner, which are these really remarkably, they're touchstones, but at the same time, they're extremely uh, difficult touchstones to kind of engage with. Um, and so much of kind of Eliot's long poem published in 1922 after the end of the First World War was assessing the war, right, assessing the cultural wasteland, this kind of implosion and explosion that had occurred at the heart of Europe in these four years, right? Where there was a kind of, in some ways, a kind of impersonalized death that I think the, uh, the continent had not seen, right? Which is, this is that story of kind of what trench warfare does, right? And I think what is, the, <laughs> what I think happens after that war is the kind of cultural production that occurs is massive, right? Which is 
the war is, has, was, I think, this kind of incredible impetus, right? And this is Eliot, who is an American from St. Louis, but spent most of his time pretending to be an Englishman. Um, kind of, I, I find this his kind of his clearest moment, right? Which is this idea that um, I won't read in an Eliot voice, but in this idea that um, that it's a little bit of an equalizer, right? That whatever is, however, in terms of the the death that has occurred, in terms of kind of thinking about it, um, that when it goes, right, a current under sea picked his bones as w in whispers as he rose and fell. He passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh you who turned the wheel and looked to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. And uh, I think that, that in some ways it's kind of the most lighthearted mo moment that a, a poem <laughs> called The Wasteland can have. Uh, I think if you call it The Wasteland, there's not much place to go uh, further down. So I think uh, we end there, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how many C's have we covered so far? Uh, um, when, we when we talked about birth, death, and rebirth, one of the, uh, for me, there's no better cliche about death and dying on the sea. Now, dying in the sea is, is probably horrific, and of course, there's an enormous amount of, of situations that have happened where they're just horrible, but in terms of culture, uh, it makes for great drama. And so I decided to have two images. Um, the one on the left to talk about the uh, Roy Lichtenstein's Drowning Girl, and uh, a production still from the 1956 film Moby Dick that John Huston directed. Um, let's take a look at those. Uh, this is a, just a perfect painting for me as an artist. When I look at this painting, I think it, it does everything that you want a painting to do, which is that it grabs you immediately, it's, it's, it's a joy to look at, it's kind of nutty, and it also makes you think because there's not a whole, the story is in there. It's like, it gives, like Lichtenstein gives you the whole, the whole enchilada is there, but there's no plate. And, and uh, this, this sort of whirling uh, vortex that Hokusai would have loved is, is in, uh, evident in the painting. You have that crazy blue that was uh, produced with new acrylic paints. Um, uh, this might have been oil, but, but certainly just the cobalt blueness is just insane. And this is the simplicity of, of uh, the black and white, and there's just uh, gorgeous lines that never repeat. Every line has a distinctly different attitude that's, that's extremely rhythmic. And then you have that insane and just wonderful, uh, almost an 80s movie line, I don't care, I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. Like, you know, like, that'd also be a good punk song. Like, there's a lyric with that in there somewhere. Um, uh, next slide. So what's great about this painting to me is that, of course, Lichtenstein, you know, he took from comic books, right? Talk about the inkiness of the water. It was like literally the ink of the, of the comic book. So he took that, that bottom right image and he completely cleansed the overriding narrative. And he did some minor changes with the text in order to focus on the wateriness of it all. So, you know, here you have a kind of standard soapbox, uh, sorry, soap opera type scenario. Uh, I'll read the top. And I guess this is coming from the girl. Uh, I was the ugly duckling in my family, not because of just one, but four beautiful sisters. Then I met Mao, but every move I made to help him only made him despise me more. But my worst mistake was when I listened to my lonely heart cry, run for love. <laughs> right, so that's the backstory to this picture. In some ways, the picture illustrates that text. And in the back, there's Mao, right? Sort of, I don't know, was a freshman at Santa Barbara, the University of Santa Barbara, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you've seen, you've seen him on campus. Yes. <laughs> And you have this wonderful moment where they're off the coast. See, I love that thing 
I, I'm giving credit to the, the original artist, is that that coast is just far enough away that you can't swim to it, right? With any good current, there's no way you're ever going to make that. And then you have the boat, which upside down looks like a shark. And you know that Mal is like, he's exhausted. He can't, he can't um, meet the girl. And she says, in her bubble is, I don't care if I have a cramp. I'd rather sink than call Mal for help. Which is, <laughs> that's just a really odd piece of text. I don't care if I have a cramp. I'd rather call Mal. Mal for help. Uh, and so there's all of this other story that's really about people, right? It's really about this story could have happened in, in a number of, of ways. It just sort of happens to take place in the ocean, but go, go back to the original painting. But Lichtenstein just completely ignores all of that. And he just says, look, this is like an insanely beautiful image. And, and I don't like all that, that cramp stuff. Because that's, that's going to detract from the image. And I don't like the, ner the name Mal, because what is that? Is that Mallory, I guess? I don't know. Brad. <laughs> Brad. Brad is the picture of Mal in our mind. So we don't even, when you think of a Brad, you think of that guy we saw. When, he, when, I, <laughs> when I say Mal, I, you go, Who, who's Mal? Mallory? Who's that? But Brad, you know what Brad looks like, and he looks like, the, like that guy. So, so can you go next, go forward. And so there's there's Brad. That really is Brad. <laughs> and there she is. And um, it's from 1962. And the, his uh, Lichtenstein space from 1963. You know the next slide. And um, I, I think what what makes this art and not just a copying of a comic book. And of course there were lots of litigation around this. Was the fact that um, Lichtenstein knew what to keep open and what to keep closed in a way that like big narratives don't, they just know how to keep everything closed in a way. So that painting is very much about the tears being the same substance as the water, as the ocean. And so he realizes that, of course, that that's the story. The story isn't Mal and the ugly duckling of the four sisters. That's not the story. The story is that the tears match the ocean. And to visually cut through all of the, the baloney of, of, the t of the text and go right to that, I think is pretty smart. And then the other thing I was thinking about when I was looking at this with the Bende dots is that, uh, which was, of course is a, a printing technique, is how similar that concept is in a lot of ways to the replication of the surface of the ways that the Asselmans does. That it's not just a flat pink. So we have the flat black, the, the flat blue, but the skin tone is this modulation and actually an undulation of very, very subtle tones of, of uh, red on top of uh, a cream color. And that's how you get the pink. So th that's, that's just, I think it's a brilliant painting. So it's a one, that's, a, that's kind of a wonderful cliche that's highlighted. And then, of course, Moby Dick, which I'm way too well acquainted with. Uh, <laughs> actually, I became a member of the Melville Society, and that's when I stopped making paintings about Moby Dick. <laughs> Because as much as I love hanging out with, with academics who know everything about Melville, I realized I literally painted myself in a corner. <laughs> what, what, what does membership to the Melville Society get you? Uh, it's a black card status. <laughs> it's an inky black card status. Um, no, it was, I actually met some great people and they actually bought some work, so that, that was nice. Um, uh, but anyway, so this brings us back to a, a Melville quote, so I'm going to put a quote in here. The white whale swam before him as the uh, monomaniac incarnation of all these malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them. That is as, as, as absolutely melodramatic writing as the comic book. And Melville knew this because Melville could, he, he, he knew what storytelling was about because he made all of his money off of like thrillers with uh, Taipei and Umu. So when he wrote Moby Dick, he couldn't help but put some of that uh, fantastic imagery in the book. When, when John Huston tried to make the movie in 1956, it's an absolutely thankless task, even though Ray Bradbury was the screenwriter, which is, which is amazing. And um, uh, go on the next slide. You know, the idea of making a movie about Moby Dick is as dumb as chasing a big white whale. <laughs> and so, this is, the, this, is, this is the part that you see on camera. What you don't see is the fact that they tried, they made a 75-foot 
um, inflatable whale that had 80, 80 compressed giant gallons of, or, or cans of canisters of air. Uh, it was 12 tons, right? This is 1956. There's no CGI, right? They're going to make a big whale, and they're going to put it in the Atlantic Ocean off Ireland. One night, the whale got loose from the tow line <laughs> and drifted away in the fog. <laughs> and it's never been found. <laughs> so, so, as horrific as the ocean is, it really knows how to have a good time when it, when it wants to, like, you know, wipe the slate clean. So, um, yeah, de the death part, I, I mean, I, I, I can't help but kind of look at it with some sense of levity because it, it's almost too terrifying to actually take on in real terms. How is the movie? I've, you know, it's, it's, I ask this Good. because it's interesting that it's Gregory Peck, right? Where yeah. Gregory Peck in a very different movie in To Kill a Mockingbird right. kind of takes on this role of kind of the lib good liberal American man, right? Yeah. And I think That's funny. in some ways we're kind of haunt haunted in good and bad ways by that image. And I'm curious of why, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why he and that film have had, has had the kind of cultural touchstone it's had. Mm. Why, mm. Why, why, do we know about why is this not go there? Back, go back to the previous slide so we can see, uh, go, no, back to the, go back to the, yeah. uh, the, one, no, the way back to the one room. Right, one more, one more, one more. One more. There we go. There he is. There. Um, oh, he's got a great face for Ahab, right? And he's got that great voice. If I was a different kind of artist, I would do a sort of, a, you know, Ahab to kill a mockingbird side by side, because it would be really interesting to see Gregory Peck in both of these mm -hmm. incarnations. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what the, the question was? No, I mean, I'm just. It, it, <laughs> It's just that, right? That the, why, why this film just has, does not have that same kind of oh. cultural presence in a I way that know. Moby Dick as a book does, yeah. right? And so, well, uh, you know, Orson Welles is in it. Richard Basehart's in it. It's filmed in color. Uh, I think I think it's an impossible movie to film without making it look just kind of like a chase movie. It's basically a car chase movie. Yeah. If you just take away all of the great writing, it's a it's a pretty slim book. Yeah, <laughs> and and so for a two-hour movie, it is it's true. Half the book is about how to cook whale meat and tie knots. So um, uh, it's worth a look, though. I'm sure you can rent it for super cheap on Netflix. All right, but the iMovie. So um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I like him. I think he's a good. A lot of people said he overacted, but how could you not overact? Yeah. I know Patrick Stewart's been Ahab and. You know, I'm sure he overacted. You know, everyone, you have to overact if you're Ahab. If you're Ahab. But, you know, it makes the C even better, right? Yeah, it does. Um, I don't know where we're at. Gone. Right. Ah, we're at Nam Le. So this is, um, I, I realize as I've kind of put all, in, that part of what I also wanted to talk about is how much in the larger conversation around refugees that we have, that is so much present in our lives, right? This is. Uh, Nam Le is a Australian-born uh, Vietnamese writer. I think he lives in the States now. And uh, this is from a collection. There's only one book. I think there's another book coming. But this is from a collection called The Boat. And um, I think it's a last story in the collection, uh, which begins, quote, the storm came on quickly. The crossed wind surged in, filtering through the ap apertures in the rotten wood, sound like a chorus of moans. The boat began to rock, hugging a beam at the top of the hatch. Mai looked out and her breath stopped. The boat had heeled so steeply that all she saw was enormous wall of black green water bearing down. She shut her eyes, opened them again. Now the gunwale had crested the water. The ocean completely vanished. And it was as though they were soaring through the air, the sky around them dark and inky and shifting. And I think part of what, what, what I find remarkable about just this paragraph, just this beginning of this story, right, which is how much this sense of foreboding and death is sitting next to 
the generative nature of this moment, right? Which is that there is, both of those ideas are, I think, very much embedded in one another, right? And so if that is in some ways part of kind of what this is doing, right? Uh, the next one that I wanted to talk about tries to do something very, very different. Can, can I just say, so yeah, please. That, that, yeah, um, go ahead. Let's go back to that last. Um, I'm, I teach a, currently teaching a course in social justice, and one of the readings is called Castaway by Charlotte McDonald Gibson. It's, it's uh, accounts of refugees crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, and it's, it's just, um, it's so unimaginable to think about people who have never seen the ocean before, people uh, living in Central Africa or, uh, or um, making it all the way to Libya, and then getting on these inflatable boats. They've never seen the ocean before. They have no context, it's let alone not knowing how to swim or anything. They've just never seen it. And all they know is that Europe's on the other side. And, and um, it's not hard to find anything online about how, how horrible these, these, these uh, uh, trips are. People, a lot of the times, don't have any life jackets, and uh, of course, many people have, have, have drowned and washed up on shore. And and the the reality of that, which is captured in in this writing, this idea of the disintegration of the things you can trust. The boat is, of course, the last thing that you that you have that's connected to the earth in any way, in any tangible way. Even materially, it's an earth object or terrestrial object. And then to have to live through the sense of that falling apart, you know, reading these stories or, or this type of text, it just, this is the, un, the difficulty of, of taking, when you take the ocean seriously, it's, it's so far beyond our capacity to enjoy it. And really, it's not a fun thing. It's, 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 it's a, it's kind of the demon of the world in some ways. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, is, it is the physical mythology that we, we live with in a way that the earth has been tamed and the skies that we fly through. The ocean, we're just on its surface and we just barely understand it. Yeah. And yet, you know, California in some ways is this kind of place that's premised on its accessibility, right? right yeah. And that, that, that if you come here, it's always going to be close close by, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, it, you know, part of what April Street was saying in the, to kind of circle back to, from where we started, you know, she said that she was inspired by this particular voyage in 1851, but she was particularly inspired by um, this location, right? She, she lives, she's a Los Angeles-based artist, but was that it was going to go up for the first time in uh, Santa Barbara. And I was thinking about that in the context of John Cheever, right, who I don't know ever went, came to Santa Barbara. But, you know, Cheever, who is the great, um, you know, bard of sad men in the American suburbs, um, you know, has the, this, this lovely collection of stories, right, this collected stories. And it is remarkable. And Cheever, I think, more than any other writer I have read, is obsessed with the ocean, right? Even, at, and I think maybe, it, it has something to do with the fact that most of the men he writes about are stuck in these lives between the jobs that they have in New York City and the lives they've chosen for themselves in the suburbs, right, in Ossining, which is where most of these kind of stories take place. And um, the, the first collection in that, the first story in that collection is called, uh, I think, what is it called? It's Goodbye, My Brother, right, which is this remarkable story about a family gathering at an oceanfront house that the family's been going, going to summer after summer for 40 years. And this particular kind of moment occurs, and, and there's one brother in the, in the story who is particularly difficult, right? And there is this climactic scene where this brother is walking away, and the narrator of the story has picked up a piece of wood and basically whacked him on the back of his head with it and he's lying on the ground uh, bleeding, right? And kind of the, it's this kind of climactic moment about the breakdown of the family, right? A breakdown of this tradition that they have had for 30 years, right? That from their jobs, they go to the ocean, they spend this time here. And um, Sheber has this way, I think, more than anybody I know, 
to nail endings that are both deeply poetic and deeply dark all at the same time. Right? There's, I, 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 there's nothing else I can tell you about them except to go read them, right? Is because he creates a certain kind of moment out of it, right? And which is, um, so I've kind of just compressed this down a little bit, but it's the, the last paragraph begins, oh, what can you do with a man like that? And then he kind of proceeds to describe the horribleness of the sibling that he's nearly killed. And then he continues, the sea that morning was iridescent and dark. My wife and my sister were swimming, Diana and Helen, uh, Cheever's a little unsubtle with his names, I think, but um, <laughs> Diana and Helen, and I saw their uncovered heads, black and gold in the dark water. I saw them come out, and I saw that they were naked, unshy, beautiful, and full of grace, and I watched the naked women walk out of the sea. And of course, you know, in our kind of more contemporary parlance, you know, Cheever has this very specific male gaze that he is placing here, right? And I think we know after Cheever's death that his gaze was kind of placed elsewhere, right? That he had kind of been in the closet for his whole life and kind of had never come out. And there is just something about, I think, um, every time I, I drive by, after all the kind of dark poems I've given you today, uh, every time I drive by kind of the ocean that this particular moment this particular kind of iridescence, this particular moment, my favorite word of their unshyness that um, I think I return to over and over again, right? Which is the inkiness on one hand, the uncertainty, the darkness, the depth on one hand, but this particular moment on the other. And um, I, think, I think also too that, that this, I think this is, a, this is evidence of a moment of purity, a purity of thought, a purity of sight. A kind of clar clarity of, of of understanding the scene in front of you that's just so beautifully laid out, and it is it is uh, of a beautiful image. Yeah, yeah. Which leads us to our final images. We're going to end on an up note, just <laughs> beauty. Um, uh, when I when I read that last Cheever. Um, uh, text last night, I, I realized I couldn't finish with what I thought I was going to finish with. And it just made me think about the beauty of seeing people emerge and swim in water. And um, of, then it just made me think of Aphrodite and of, of all the great paintings that have been made about her and her birth from the sea, from, from a castration to like how, how castration leads to the genesis of sexuality to me is like only something that Greece can pull off. Well, maybe not. Maybe that's just I'm limited in what I know. But um, uh, the whisperings of maidens and smiles and deceits with sweet delight and love and graciousness. I mean, Aphrodite being not just sexuality, but also communion of physical bodies, right? The male and female and love and the beginnings, not just desire, but, but also um, a peace, I think, of the body in, in its own beauty. Um, one of the things that, I'm, you know, we all, we, most of us know that Eros is, is the, 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 the most, uh, the child that we know of, of Aphrodite. But I, I didn't know that she also had like five other children, at least five that we know of, because she's a very fertile person. Um, uh, Himeros and uh, Pothos, which are um, uh, uh, desire, a different type of desire, like sexual desire. You have uh, Phobos, which is fear. You also have um, Harmonia, harmony. And so this is idea that, that at, coming from the ocean, she also has all these other abilities as well. Like she can engender a lot of different uh, aspects that aren't just about love. But because I think she's from the water, that I, I was thinking of this notion that those are all, those are all characteristics of the water. Go to the next slide. And that, this is a, you know, old painting from, from Pompeii and, and uh, uh, 
supposedly there was a there was a courtesan named uh, uh, Freni, and being a courtesan in in the ancient world, of course, was not anything you would want to be. Although you could be famous because you could be so cool, I guess. But uh, she she would during certain festivals, this courtesan would swim naked in the ocean. And there's this idea that the imagery of Venus, as we know it, came out of this courtesan uh, bathing during these festivals. And um, uh, yeah, I, I like this idea of a kind of powerful tranquility coming from the ocean in the form of, of Venus and Aphrodite. I think it's pretty outstanding. And the next one. So we're going to end on a highly technological note. Uh, so, in the course of, you know, uh, my frenzy of trying to put piece all this last images together in Aphrodite, apparently in the early 20th century there was a, a uh, British archaeologist and historian named John Mearns who was sitting uh, in an island, a Greek island, and he saw waves hit each other at 90 degree angles and form a spout. And he came up with, which is the wave theory of Aphrodite which is that this motion of two, two forceful bodies of water coming together, making a spout, is where Aphrodite comes from. Something of pure beauty, something of you know, sublime uh, communication, and also something that's really uh, unspeakable. So it's, it's, it's hard to explain. This is, the, this, is this uh, flow wave. Uh, research facility in the University of Edinburgh. It's pretty new. It, it's, it's uh, I think, 30 meters across. It has two and a half million liters of water. It can replicate every surface condition of the ocean in one place. And they use it to understand how things float. And I thought it was interesting that this, these, to, to end on this this, this notion of this kind of um, our incapacity to fully speak about the ocean is something that uh, uh, ultimately is just inherently beautiful. So I have, um, and we're going to end on a short clip video of this in motion. Is that a good place to stop before we have questions? I hope my leg's not asleep. Um, I walk like Ahab <laughs> over. <laughs> Uh, we can dim the lights a little bit, please. We can do that. So this the sound is added. It's 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 not the sound you hear. This is a super slow motion of two water spouts that they can create at this facility. Oops, sorry. to stop.
Ever since my company oh, started sorry. using WalkMe to guide us through all of our systems and digital platforms, my work has gotten a lot simpler. I tell you, you just can't escape that shit. <laughs> right, we'll, end, we'll end with, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. There we go. Let's just, let's put that, let's put her up there. First of all, a more official thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> and if there are questions, I'm happy to take mine to you. So I'm going to... Apparently, we have been mesmerized. <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> exactly. There's a way in which water just silences us all. Yes. <laughs> There's a question. So, it's interesting you're using the ocean. And as you know, uh, in A River Runs Through It, I'm Haunted by Moving Water <laughs> is the end of one of the statements. That you, and, and that comes to mind when you see that last moving water. It's extraordinary to see something like that. So why didn't you comment about rivers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why didn't you talk about rivers? No, no, no. no it's, a, it's, it's actually, it, it's an interesting question, right? Which is in, in, in a way in which, and this is a little bit of a cop-out to say in the second conversation, um, but that there is a way in which there are particularities based on how we talk about oceans versus the way in which we talk about lakes, right? That it, in a, uh, that in that book, in the Norman McLean book in particular that you're referencing, right? Which is, I think, you, you just made a reference to the end, but you know that there is, in, in the beginning, kind of I think there's that line, which is in my family, there's, what was it, like religion and fly fishing? Is that the? Right, exactly. So that it, there is, and for me, so much, I think this is not speaking to your river question, but speaking to how much in that particular novel that it is a, a novel about Montana, right? And kind of at a certain level, not completely, but that there is in a way that uh, this is a book by Jim Harrison, which was, I think I always kind of, in the way that I picture, um, uh, what's his name, Gregory Peck with, uh, uh, with uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, I always think about Brad Pitt, unfortunately, with this film, or with this book, right? But I, I think in a way, th th there is just a, a very specific way in which he talks about it there, right? You know, and kind of as opposed to the ways in which kind of, uh, you know, rivers might operate in, 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 in a different way, right? And I think you've clearly stumped me on why I didn't talk about rivers. <laughs> um, I, I have a much simpler, uh, I, I, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, so the only river I know is the LA River, <laughs> yeah. which, I've, which I've driven on, <laughs> literally. But yeah, I really don't know rivers at all, but I'm sure they're just as mythic in the mind of someone growing up. If you're next to a good river, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of crappy rivers. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, is there something in the way that we talked about it that you think that there's an entire different conversation to be had if this, this was a different conversation, or that, no? The river looks the same as you're looking at it, and you realize it isn't the same. Yeah. But it looks exactly the same, going over the rock, going down, it, and, and the ocean's never the same. It's, it's, it's yeah. vast. Yeah. The river's predictable, you can watch it, you, you know what might live there, or yeah. where to cross it, or where it's at. Yeah. The ocean is totally unpredictable, based yeah. upon a lot more uh, natural events occurring. Yeah, and the river, river has flow. I mean, the river, you, gener you always know where it's going, even if it's slow or fast. It's going in one direction. Um, yeah. Well, one thing is that all the, um, besides that all the rivers flow to the sea, all of life kind of was the origins. You're talking about life and rebirth and death, and we came from the sea, and we were born in a watery womb, and all those sort of salty sea, unpredictable things 
take on a kind of mythic symbolic thing, and I think that's kind of what I got from your talk was was trying to address that the, the terror of it as well as the profound beauty of it. But I love that you ended with Aphrodite. Oh, good. Don't don't we go through some like weird amphibious stage in our body, right? There's a part where we're fishy. Yeah, I that's I can't even comprehend how that all folds under. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it's really it's really it's really the we talk about Mother Earth, but it's really Mother Ocean, right? And uh, I think it's our fear that. Uh, stops us from uh, being too close to it. Although in Santa Barbara, I mean, it's, living in Southern California, it's, it's always just the most amazing backdrop. I think, I think there's an uh, enormous amount of narcissism when you have these types of environments like Santa Barbara and Los Angeles, where, where it just wants to feel like you know, you're so cool to be, have this in your background. You know what I mean? And and so that's kind of that's a real lie about what the ocean is. You know, it's it's no it's backseat to no one, especially you. And and I think um, yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Well, I'd like to give equal time to lakes. I grew up in the East Coast <laughs> on a small lake, huge pond, and to me, it's a much more personal relationship with the water. Uh, it's physically more understandable. You see the shore, of course, everywhere. I remember when I was a child in New Jersey, I was reading a book about the ocean, and I couldn't, in my mind, conceive of what it would be like to look across water and not see the other side, because mm -hmm. I had never seen the ocean. Anyway, um, but there, the lake is the location of so many intimate experiences. Um, that changed with the seasons. I mean, everything from ice skating and um, building snow forts on the ice um, to swimming, of course, and interacting with the wildlife there. Um, I remember swimming, and, and the little fish would come up and nip at my legs. I mean, it was very intimate water experience all through my life. And since I moved to California near the ocean, I don't feel that intimacy at all. It's an area of... Um, I, I've find it a little bit dangerous. You know, I wouldn't really want to go in too much. So I don't know. I just think that, that water, our relationship with water can really change depending on the size and the intimacy of how we interact with it. And I don't know why I'm saying that, but I want to give some time to yeah. lakes too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think too is that, is that um, the reflectivity of lakes is, is so much different than the ocean. The ocean doesn't reflect anything other than the sky, so it's pretty brutal. You know, even when it's calm, and I, I've sailed quite a bit, spent a lot of time sailing Catalina, and um, there's times when it's absolutely flat, and it's still not pretty. It's just foreboding, you know. But, but lakes have a way of capturing clouds that oceans don't, you know. Sunsets. Ocean's always doing its own thing. Whereas my experience with lakes uh, has always been about it's it, it 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 feels even if they're they're imposing they always feel there's a comfort to them mm. that the ocean doesn't give me. Thank you so much for your talk. It's been lovely. Um, you know, so um, perhaps I'm <laughs> divulging my divulging my um, ignorance here, but. You know, I don't. I'm not familiar with the artists um, in in the um, stairway, right, the staircase. And so, when I heard about this talk and it was described about this image, right, of the ocean or, or of the water, I must say I walked in and I was waiting to see what the, the original work will look like, and I was actually quite surprised how small it was. Like there were small pieces of the water or versions of the water sort of pieced along this very big wall, right? And why I sympathize with the curatorial concerns <laughs> of like how to place this, I, I think I was surprised because so much of the water, um, um, I just assume to feel overwhelmed by it, right? 
because what the ocean, and I think that um, piece you had up there, which was just so dramatic, especially when that big scene with those, uh, the drawing, right, of the uh, artistic rendition, right, of, of that thing, it was just, it has that feeling of foreboding, but also a feeling overwhelmed. And, and here it is so approachable, right on the wall, and it was so small, and I just thought, well, I was wondering, if you can address why the artist made the paintings, these small paintings of s several of them, rather than a, a big one or something that would cover that wall. Yeah. Also, you know, the other thing about that, those paintings that I found quite familiar to me um, and surprising was actually it reminded me of Georgia O'Keeffe in that the way that the, her, the drawing of water it reminded me of stone and of boulders of this beautiful Abiquiu landscape of New Mexico, yeah. right? Which is where I'm from, actually. Yeah. So um, that's where my reference was. And so I thought maybe it's just in blue instead of yeah. reds and golds and... and it, yeah. um, I, well, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I totally see that O'Keeffe reference. It's, and it's really funny you say that because I also, I, I never, when I think of O'Keeffe paintings in my mind, I don't think of them as being expansive either. They always seem like I'm, I'm, they're, they're more of an introspection of, the, of this grand landscape. And that they're, you know, even, even when she's painting a, a, a horizon, there's something about it that's very, they're very limited about what she's trying to do within the context of the painting. So I, I totally get that uh, O'Keeffe reference. I, I do think that what April was, April was not really trying to tackle the sea, and I was trying to get that across in the beginning, is that I think she was more interested in the couple. And if you can imagine um, you know, old photographs uh, or daguerreotypes, so you've seen daguerreotypes, there's a really small imagery, in the, but they really speak volumes, even though they're really tightly compressed spaces. So I think one of the things she was interested in is making a series of compressed spaces that almost acted like moments of memory that were then given to you kind of buffet style so that you, you couldn't actually point to a central uh, aperture and say, here is where she begins to talk about the sea. I think that for a couple uh, like the, the, the Creases who, who had spent their lives dealing with the ocean, it, it was, the sea was completely wound up with their relationship, like their, their husband and wifeness. And um, so therefore it couldn't be extracted uh, into an abstraction, and and I think the immensity is an abstraction, and uh, so I think that was a very conscious on April's part to to push away the sea in favor of the sea as to some extent the the frame of this couple. I mean, I, it's interesting question because I was to go back to this phrase that was used earlier about talking about the intimacy of lakes, right? And I thought that idea of intimacy is interesting because. It's a way in which we can talk about being intimate with a small body of water in a way that usually we're not, we wouldn't talk about it in the same way, right? I mean, I think there are plenty of people who are intimate with the ocean and intimate with the sea, but it's not usually kind of the way in which that relationship is articulated. And I think part of what I'm wondering is that in some ways the smallness is the only way to be intimate with that large space, right? Meaning that there's such a vastness to the topic, right? And so I think that there are all sorts of ways in which a visual artist in a way can deal with it, right? Where the camera can be all the way out in the way that some of the pieces that you had earlier are, are doing that, right? But I think that what the other, or the other, in some ways, the opposite option, right, is how do you manage this topic, right? And I think to your point, which is you manage it by dealing with this couple. But the fact is, most of the pieces there are not about the couple, right? That they're about her attempt to deal with the physicality of this space, mm -hmm. right? And how to kind of present the physicality. And, um, and so I, I can't, of course, can't speak for her, but that maybe that is the, that, Intimacy is the only answer, right? That smallness of particularity is the only way in which to manage something that is otherwise, you know, completely immanageable, right? That there is no way to get that whole part of it. But I think it is, it, it is an interesting thing, right? Which is this question of 
what kind of the ways the expectations we have with the in term the relationship between scale and topic right which is that is there a way in which certain things deserve a certain kind of scale for us to have the emotive experience that we're supposed to have right and i think to your point what this does is i think it kind of turns that around a little bit right which is that that perhaps that emotive experience can be had in the very very <laughs> kind of minute in the particular as opposed to part of the expectation which is the grandness of it, right? Which is as you started by saying that there's something kind of strangely ungrand about this staircase. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we have one one last you had a question, sir. I think that would be the last one. I was wondering what you thought about <clears throat> horizon in relation to ocean, where when I think about it, uh, ocean meets sky, causing a horizon, and um, how that would affect some of your thinking. Yeah, well, that's where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> it's the horizon. <laughs> no, I, I'm, glad, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because, um, especially thinking about Rothko, and those, those beautiful planes, right? Everyone refers to them, especially the later works, where there really just is horizon. There's earth and sky or something, a moonscape and you know, space. Um, I, I, you know, he didn't write very much later on, but um, he went on a trip in the 50s. It was the 50s. Uh, he didn't want to fly. He, he took an ocean liner to, to Europe to, to go on a trip. And I just, I just, I, I just have images of Rothko on the deck of the ship, looking out into the expanse and just seeing the horizon and the sea, and saying, "This is it. This is all there is. This is what I need to talk about, if not explicitly, then implicitly." Because he he talked very much about tragedy and ecstasy and doom, and he talked about this notion of there had to be in his work the complete human experience. And the complete human experience has to involve uh, a cathartic relationship, or at least a tense relationship, between opposites, between life and death and existence and non-existence. So I, I, I always think of the, the horizon line for Rothko as it must have been a really powerful moment on that ship to see that day after day, to wake up, to walk out, to think about his paintings back in his studio, to think about the paintings he was going to make uh, uh, and uh, it fit right in very nicely with his, his, his aims. Um, and for me personally as a sailor, um, and not having sailed in lakes or rivers, uh, I, I'm going to tell you a little story, <laughs> sorry. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had, in, in 1999, I had just broken up with a, a, a girlfriend and I was very sad. <laughs> I had my sailboat. And it was going to be the new year, the 2000, the new millennium. And I didn't know what to do. What am I going to do? Like, I'm so heartbroken. I'm such romantic. So I went on my sailboat. So I'm going to go to the backside of Catalina Island. I'm just going to go to the backside of the island. I'm going to be where nobody is. And I sailed on my boat and I remember the sun starting to set and listening on the radio to New Year's Eve in Sydney, Australia with the sun setting and me alone in my boat and seeing the horizon line. And I kid you not, there were dolphins in the ocean while I'm hearing this new millennium happening. And, and what that horizon did for me was not so much give me a place of, of comfort, but it gave me a, it gave me a moment in which to guide my future. And, and that the notion of the horizon line for sailors, as bleak as it is in the middle of the ocean, it always, it, oddly enough, it always offers promise, which I think is crazy. It's absolutely nuts. So uh, I don't look at it as, as being limitless. I, I always see it as being always within reach somehow. And not in some crazy hopeful way, but in just some, it, it's, it's, there is, the horizon can always be touched. If, if not, then there's no point to anything. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that very happy note. Thank you.
I want to thank both of you for a remarkable conversation. Uh, I think we all felt that we were a part of it, not just listening to it. And um, I will give a hopeless pun and say thank you for broadening our horizon. Oh. <laughs> oh. And with that, you will flee the room. Oh. Drop the mic on that one. Drop the mic.